All right. Um, it looks as though some of us have started our spring break a bit early. Uh, or you're taking your multivariate calculus exam next period, uh, one or the other. Uh, the one advantage of people alerting me to the fact that they may not be here is the justifications they're giving now, they're using economic concepts, explaining their opportunity cost and trying to be on a production possibility frontier, rather than coming to my class. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me, but nevertheless, I appreciate you using the concepts in your daily decision making. By the way, I'll call your attention to the board. Um, I want to move the readings that are assigned for 410 to April 3rd, the lecture when you come back from spring break. And the reason I want to do that is that lecture goes to natural resources in agriculture. And importantly, the reason for doing that is a special event that is occurring on Thursday evening in which uh, five prominent people are coming to speak on a panel about agricultural resources. One an environmental perspective, a fellow that's head of the environmental working group is going to be here, which is a natural, national uh, environmental public think tank. Um, Mike Pollan, who I presume most of you have heard of or know of, uh, is going to be speaking as well. And we know what his views are. The Secretary of Food and Agriculture from the state of California is going to be here. Uh, the other person is the person who's head of the Center for uh, Obesity and Health on the Berkeley campus is going to be speaking as well. So I'm hoping for those of you who don't have high opportunity costs that you're able to attend that special event. If you're not, then I strongly suggest that you review uh, the YouTube description and presentation of that event because it's likely that you'll see it at some later point in time. For example, you will see it on the final in some shape or form. All right? Is that clear? Yes. I'm moving the lecture that's on your syllabus that is now listed for April 10th and moving it to April 3rd, and everything is just move forward one lecture. Okay? No, you're not skipping a lecture, just rearranging the lectures. Because you won't, you won't be able to fully appreciate what takes place at that special event, whether you attend or review it later, unless you have the foundation of the lecture. And I want to give you that foundation before the event, not after the event. Right there. Thursday, April 5th. Okay? Is that clear? We're all, yes? Yes, it's free, but you have to have a ticket before they let you in. But it's a free ticket. Uh, on the first floor of Genie Hall, one floor below my office. Okay. Since you haven't been to see me during class hours, you may not know where that is, but it's on the first floor. <laughs> what? Okay, fine. Uh, all right. Any other questions? Okay, it's clear. Would you share the information with her, please, and make sure that she knows what's going on? All right. We left off in the last lecture with benefits and costs. I want to go through the three different methodologies that I briefly described at the end of the lecture and give you a bit more substance about those three different criteria for determining whether, in fact, an investment should be made or whether a public good provision should be supported. And then I want to turn to today's lecture, and I'm hoping that what comes out of this lecture is all the complications with regard to externalities, damages, how do we represent marginal benefits, marginal costs, and you can draw the graphs lots of different ways. Right? Uh, and the graphs can become very complicated. And you saw that in your problem set for today. Was it the second problem set that had A through E? And that the language is sort of heavy, right? But at the end of the day, it's really just a question about how you go about graphing the relationships that you're attempting to use to explain what the most efficient solution is. All right? So we'll go back and forth between some simple graphs versus the more complicated graphs that appear in the textbook readings for today's lecture. So if I go too fast, and you don't understand moving from one graph to another, you have to step forward. If you're not prepared to step forward, I'm going to assume you understand. Right? That's always true, right? But it's going to be particularly true today. All right. The criteria for public pro projects. Um, ultimately, we want to quantify both the benefits and the cost. Uh, and we want to include in our benefits all the benefits, not just market benefits that can be readily measured, but as well the non-market benefits. Let's take a concrete example to motivate this. Let's suppose society is considering constructing a dam. Uh, what are the potential benefits? The market-based benefits could be electricity output, uh, increased irrigation, all of which are readily measurable. Uh, changes in recreational benefits, that may not be easily quantified, and as a result, we have to turn to reveal preference or straight state preference methodologies to get a fix on what the benefits might be from recreational activities. On the cost side, we want to include all the costs, including whatever environmental damages take place by clearing land, uh, by flooding uh, certain uh, properties, um, endangering or eliminating some special species, uh, endangered species in particular, those are all potential environmental costs that could result from the construction of the dam, and those costs should be this included as well. And it's nothing more than going back and thinking about the difference between private cost versus external cost, adding the two together to get social cost, as you did in problem two on the set, problem set for today. There may be some loss of biodiversity that should be taken into account as well. Okay, the first of these three methodologies, we've already briefly discussed this methodology, it's net present value. Because this, this dam, if we construct it, is going to have a long life, right? Um, it's going to be probably composed of concrete that lasts for at least 20 or 30 years. We have to take into account the flow of benefits and costs over that complete horizon. Net present value is nothing more than the difference between the present value of benefits and the present value of costs. If it's positive, then we know that the benefits outweigh the cost in present value terms. Uh, and if we're looking at a host of different projects, we want to pick that project that has the highest net present value. Right? And if you rank various projects, uh, the first one out of the box should be the one with the highest net present value. Now, the second methodology is widely used, particularly by the public sector, federal government, state governments, even county governments, in making evaluations of different projects. They look at the benefit-cost ratio. And as we noted in the last lecture, there's no mystery. If it turns out that the benefit-cost ratio is greater than one, then the present value of benefits must be larger than the present value of costs. Right? So why, why the two different criteria, if they give you the same answer? Do they give you the same answer? We want to examine that question. 
So as I indicated, it's the ratio of the present value of benefits to the present value of cost. If it's greater than one, then we know our benefits are larger, present value benefits are larger than the present value of cost. Um, and as I've already noted, that ratio will be greater than one if and only if the net present value is greater than zero. Now, can these two different criteria be used interchangeably? To get an understanding and the intuition for why they will on occasion lead to different outcomes is that when we're using the net present value, we're, in the business, we're engaged in trying to find that investment that gives us the largest net present value. In doing that, we are not operating with any constraint on the amount of resources that we can expend. So there are no restrictions. And when there's no restrictions with regard to the available capital, then the net present value is, in fact, the right criteria that should be used. However, if the amount of capital that's available is constrained or a fixed amount, which is noted here in number two, it's fixed at some predetermined level C star, uh, then we want to go through the process of evaluating benefits and costs under that constraint. We can't expand any more than C star. And now the benefit-cost ratio gives us the right answer, and we should end up choosing the one uh, that completely exhausts the available amount of capital C star, uh, and we make that allocation in accordance with the ranking that is available from the ratio or the benefit-cost ratio. Okay? Let's look at a concrete example. This, one, this example is discussed in your book. Uh, and there's only one difference between this graph and what's, what's presented in your textbook reading. I think with regard to the small dam, uh, they refer to this as levies. That is to say, there's some investment in levies instead of investing in some large dam. And the levies have hopefully the same functionality with regard to protecting the environment against floods. Right? And in the basic data, the present value of benefits for the small dam or the levies is represented here as 20 million. The present value of all the costs is 10 million. Uh, and thus, the present value of net benefits is 10 million. And the benefit cost ratio is 2, which is nothing more than the 20 million divided by 10 million. Right? Very straightforward, very simple. Uh, the large dam, in contrast, generates present value of benefits of 35 million, a present value of cost of 20 million, with a net present value of 15 million, and a benefit cost ratio that's lower uh, than the investment in levies and or small dams. Right? Okay, so looking at that outcome, you say, well, listen, if I have no constraint on the amount of resources, and the amount of resources are represented in monetary terms by the project cost, by this particular column here, if there is no constraint on the resources, then clearly the best choice is going to be the large dam. Right? And that's exactly what we state at the bottom of this uh, table. Namely, if we're not constrained by funding, you end up choosing the, largest, the large dam because it yields the greatest net benefit. However, if there's a limited amount of funding, then as we argued in the prior slide, you want to select those projects with the highest ratio. And to give you some intuitive feel for this, if we had a budget constraint of $100 million uh, and we were evaluating how to allocate that $100 million, uh, it turns out that it may not be in our best interest to invest in a large project, um, in part because here with that budget constraint, I can generate more in the way of net present value by using the benefit-cost ratio, uh, in investing in a number of levies or small dams, 10, because I'm going to end up with more net present value than if I were to invest in five large dams. Just to add up the numbers. In one case, if I took that 100 million, uh, that would completely exhaust uh, my available funding for five dams, right? And the net present value would sum to 75 million, correct? However, if I took 100 million and allocated ac across, because it's 10 million per small dam or levies, that would be 100 million, and I would generate 25 million dollars more in net present value by selecting the 10 small versus the five large, right? Okay. Now, the more challenging criteria is the internal rate of return, and as I briefly explained in the last lecture, the internal rate of return is computed by making one unknown in the equation that the present value of benefits is equal to the present value of cost. Now, you may ask yourself, when in the world do you want to do that? Because I may not know what the social discount rate is. If you bring a, a group of informed citizens that are paying attention to some public good investment and bring them all into a room, I don't care if it's five people or 100 people or 5,000 people, you're going to have a host of different opinions about what the right social discount rate is. I'm sure if we all sat around, the 100 or so of us, and debated about uh, the question of the construction of a dam for flood control, many of us would have far different views of what the proper social discount rate might be. So if that's the case and you can't come to a consensus about what the right answer is for the social discount rate, and remember our discussion about Nordhaus versus Stern in the last lecture, Stern arguing that it should be basically zero for society as a whole, and Nordhaus coming along saying, no, it should be a market rate of interest with regard to the appropriate discount rate. Now, if we can't resolve that, then at a minimum, we can use this third criteria to compute what would be the internal rate of return that would equalize the present value of benefits with the present value of cost. And suppose that internal rate of return is very low. Then we don't have to debate very much. Because if because if in our discussion we're all above that internal rate of return, then it makes it crystal clear that we should move forward with regard to that investment. Does that all make sense? Let's go through it mechanically. Okay. So this is the equation. There's one unknown and one equation. The unknown is the IRR, which is the internal rate of return. That is computable. And then how do we apply that? Uh, if it turns out that our opportunity cost of funds, or our social discount rate, which is a measure of what the opportunity cost of funds are for society as a whole, if the IRR turns out to be greater than that rate, and I'm defining that as a hurdle rate, and that's a common... Uh, designation of the internal rate of return, mostly in the business world. Um, if you go to an MBA course throughout the country and they talk about investments uh, in various plants or assets, uh, they often compute uh, an internal rate of return and they compare it to their hurdle rate, and their hurdle rate is nothing more than the opportunity cost of their scarce resources. That's all it is. 
So if it turns out that that internal rate of return is larger than the hurdle rate, then obviously, if I were to put in the hurdle rate, the present value benefits is going to outweigh the present value cost, right? Uh, and vice versa. If it turns out it's less, then the project should not be built. Now, each of the prior two criteria, either the net present value or the benefit cost ratio, it assumes that you know what the social discount rate is because you couldn't compute those, right? You couldn't compute the present value of future benefit flows or the present value of future cost flows unless you know what the rate of discount or what the interest rate is that should be used uh, in determining the present value. Now, um, looking at these three different criteria um, and what happens with regard to decision makers or policy makers, often it turns out that we don't have perfect information. Uh, but nevertheless, we want to make some choice. Uh, and the question about the future flows of the benefits and if there are costs that might be incurred in the future as well, those flows may be highly uncertain. And moreover, we may not have accurate data about what's going to happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Uh, and we're forced, nevertheless, to make a choice, either to do nothing or to do something. Uh, and in doing so, we want to use the best available information. And even though the net present value may be larger than zero and the benefit cost ratio that you compute, recognizing the data limitations, is larger than one, and your internal rate of return is higher than anybody's reasonable estimate of what the hurdle rate might be or the social uh, opportunity cost associated with scarce resources. Suppose all those things are true. It doesn't mean that everyone's better off. Right? That's in the aggregate. Stop and think about the example. I live in the Berkeley Hills. There are a number of parts in the Berkeley Hills. If the city of Berkeley came along and said, we want to have a waste disposal site 20 feet from the border of your home, what do you think my reaction would be? Now, it may turn out that the benefit cost ratio is greater than one. It may turn out that the net present value is greater than zero. Uh, and moreover, the internal rate of re return is much higher than Berkeley, the city of Berkeley's opportunity cost of funds. But even under all those circumstances, I'm going to object. Um, because if it's placed there, I'm going to be worse off, even though the aggregate net present value is positive. A, a better example, uh, in a real world example, because Berkeley would never, never attempt to put a landfill site in the Berkeley Hills. That ain't going to happen. Not in my lifetime. Um, a better example, do you know Iron, where Iron Mountain is in Nevada? You don't have to know where it is. But here's the story. Many years ago, the federal government decided that they had to manage uh, toxic waste, nuclear waste in particular. There are a number of nuclear power plants, and they had to dispose of their nuclear waste. So there was an active public debate about this, and ultimately legislation was passed to locate a toxic waste disposal site in Nevada, in which there were not a lot of people around this particular location, so it doesn't sound like the right answer. They've attempted for the last few decades to open that particular site for managing toxic waste, nuclear toxic waste in particular. It still hasn't happened. Why? Because the residents within the state of Nevada have brought judicial actions, legal actions, to prohibit opening that particular site. So what's happened is all that waste is backed up and is held at the site at which it's being produced. Um, so there are distributional consequences. Remember our original discussion about equity, efficiency versus equity? Efficiency clearly holds here with regard to all three of the criteria we just talked about, but it doesn't say anything about equity. It doesn't say anything about the distributional consequences. But as informed citizens or as policy analysts or as public decision makers, it's important to take into account those dis distributional consequences as well. Let's take a concrete example, an active learning example, and let's make it close to home. Let's suppose there are no oil refineries in Richmond, which is not true, so just abstract with me for a moment. Right? And now the city of Richmond is sitting there and saying, should we give entitlements and permits to construct uh, refineries in Richmond? Right? Now, we know that the refineries uh, end up creating pollutants, but they also end up producing employment uh, and, moreover, generating fuels that have positive market values. Right? And if you did a benefit-cost analysis, let's suppose, which would be true if you did a complete analysis, that in the aggregate the benefits uh, outweigh the total cost, including, including the environmental damages. Now, the question for you is, as, let's suppose you're, you are the city manager for Richmond. Why in the world do you want to do that is beyond me? But let's suppose you are. Um, it's remarkable about their schools, but that's another story. Um, so as a policymaker, you're asked whether or not the project should be implemented, that is to say a permit given, based on the studies that actually pass all three of the criteria we talked about. Benefit cost ratio, net present value being positive, and the internal rate of return being much higher uh, than the hurdle rate. So visit with your neighbor. Tell me what the answer is. Or what your answer is, not the answer. Pardon? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Sure, sure. Okay, Cameron, what's the answer? <laughs> 